Welcome to Pleasant Green Sunday School. This is Lesson 3 for September the 18th, 2016. We're still in Unit 1 entitled The Sovereignty of God. Our topic for today taken from the Adult Quarterly is Ultimate Power. Our devotional reading is taken from Isaiah chapter 40 verses 1 through 8. Our background scripture is taken from Isaiah chapter 40. Uh, and our print passage today is Isaiah chapter 40 uh, verses 21 through 31. Our key verse reads, Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary and his understanding no one can fathom. Our lesson aims today, number one, is to contrast God's power to control and affect change with humans' inability to do the same. Number two, reflect on the poetic imagery the writer used to witness to God's sovereign power and personal presence with the people. And the third aim is to embrace God's sovereignty and ability to address situations and uh, needs that humans face. We have three outlines today that we will be discussing. Uh, the first one is entitled The Ultimate Creator. The second one uh, is entitled The Ultimate Authority. And the third outline is entitled The Ultimate Source of strength. We certainly thank and praise God that we are able to come to you again to share this Sunday school lesson with you uh, in a time where we desperately need encouragement um, from our God, from our Lord and our Savior. And we hope that you have been uh, following with us uh, as we study uh, through the book of Isaiah. Uh, can be a little complex to understand uh, but hopefully uh, through this lesson today we can share something with you uh, from the book of Isaiah that will help you and we certainly going to give you some scriptures to uh, reinforce our views I want to read a little bit of the biblical context taken from the adult quarterly for this lesson the book of Isaiah is considered one of the most important books of the Old Testament. Um, called during the long reign of Isaiah, Isaiah prophesied against the social ills of his day. He strenuously warned uh, the nation against foreign alliances and challenged the people to trust in God. Some biblical scholars divide the book into two distinct parts or sections. Chapters 1 through 39 deal with various prophecies against Israel and Judah and the nations around them. These prophecies related to events that were primarily uh, to occur during his ministry. Beginning with chapter 40 uh, through the end of this book, uh, his prophecies look forward to the return of the exiles from Babylon and to other events beyond his day. Isaiah chapter 40 begins the section of his book that foresees a future hope and comfort after the Babylonian captivity. The remnant in Babylon looked back and only saw defeat and disgrace because of their sin, but Isaiah reminded them of the greatness of God and the weakness of the false gods of the Gentiles. Isaiah announced that Israel's God is superior to anything in heaven or on earth. And so as we get into uh, this prophecy, there was something interesting in the introduction for this lesson that uh, I want to read just a portion of this uh, because I think it, it's helpful to understand uh, what do we do with history? Uh, what do we do with prophecy, particularly Old Testament prophecy? How do we uh, use this Old Testament prophecy uh, going out to Judah 
uh, to help us today in 2016. But in the introduction, uh, the last uh, part of this is uh, really helping me, and I hope it helps you. Uh, it says, uh, it was then that Isaiah prophetically turned the corner on uh, in chapter 40 and began to emphasize God's intention to bring comfort and future deliverance to them. His was a call of comfort and an exhortation to accept the comfort that God offered. The ultimate uh, creator provides ultimate power to comfort in all life's struggles. But what was interesting to me uh, was the fact that we have been offered um, an invitation or comfort, if you will, and an exhortation uh, to accept the comfort that God offered. And that, that's what I really wanted to push. Uh, and it's very important if we want to benefit or receive uh, from what God is providing and Judah had to make a decision as well as Israel they had to make a decision if they would accept uh, what Isaiah had to offer through God but the background um, scripture for this uh, lesson was the entire 40th chapter of uh, Isaiah and I hope that you will read all of that we will uh, obviously be in verses 21 uh, through 31 today um, but the other thing that I wanted to note uh, as we looked at the entire chapter the 40th chapter of the book of Isaiah is repetition uh, why is there such an emphasis uh, uh, and we have to pay careful attention to repetition in the Bible and if you read all of Isaiah uh, chapter 40 you will see uh, repetition so from Isaiah's perspective the restoration after the exile inaugurates the new age and this first taste of salvation through God's servant that would be King Cyrus coalesce with the greater salvation that Christ God's servant will bring his people today the elect have even more confidence in words of prophecy because these have been fulfilled in Christ and are being fulfilled in his church and I want you to look at 2nd Peter chapter 1 verse 19 so let us keep this in mind as the Lord is offering comfort to his people. We were going to begin uh, with this first outline uh, entitled The Ultimate Creator uh, taken from Isaiah chapter 40 verses 21 through 24. I want to read this from the NIV translation. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood since the earth was founded. He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth and its people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. He brings princesses to naught and reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. No sooner are they planted no sooner are they sown, no sooner do they take root in the ground than he blows on them and they wither, and a whirlwind sweeps them away like chaff. And so as we look at this, uh, Isaiah is looking at the creation of God. He is impressing upon uh, God's people to, to take a look at the creative acts of God but it says here the weak and puny idols worshipped by Israel's Gentile conquerors and by some among them uh, paled in comparison to the power and greatness of God Isaiah reminded them that God is the ultimate creator not the lifeless idols uh, they were so prone to worship 
In vivid sarcasm, the prophet declared to them the futility of trying to portray, portray them uh, uh, um, of God in the form of a man-made idol, no matter how ornate, durable, or immovable. Isaiah told the people that as the creator, it is God who exercises sovereign control over the world. His rhetorical questions in verse 21 are designed to remind them that the revelation handed down regarding the creation of all things by God should have convinced them of the futility of idolatry and of God's omnipotence. Do we see that in creation when we see all that God has uh, created if we go out and we look up at the the heavens and we look at the stars what do you uh, grasp about God how great he is that he has done all of these things so we have a responsibility we're going to talk about that a little bit more to appreciate what God has already done keep in mind as we said earlier that uh, uh, this look ahead or uh, that uh, Isaiah uh, is is uh, referencing here to uh, the the Christ that would come as we learn in this chapter uh, that has already taken place uh, if you couple that with uh, what God has done uh, I like this here it says uh, we should be convinced uh, and that's very good and that's very noteworthy that we be confident um, that God is almighty he is all powerful uh, creation tells us that and so the encouragement is is that if he can do all of these things then surely he has not forgotten about you and what you're going through but Judah uh, had to endure captivity because of their sin but that was only uh, for a designated time uh, the Bible says, I believe here in uh, Isaiah 40, that they received double from the Lord's hand according to their iniquities. But that period has ended and God wants them to look ahead to uh, the restoration or the first taste of deliverance, uh, salvation even in the Old Testament. But verse 22 stresses both his omniscience and his omnipotence. He sees all from his throne above the horizon of the earth and uses his power to stretch out the heavens like a curtain um, and a tent for him. God also controls history. It is he who both establishes and removes rulers and negates the rulings of judges. These truths would have been especially comforted, comforting to those living under the great uh, the threat of captivity and z exile and that's beautiful to know it doesn't matter what we are going through or what situation uh, we may be in uh, keep in mind in this uh, unit one that we have been talking about uh, is entitled the sovereignty of God God's rule God's reign God's authority over everything and so it doesn't matter what is going on God is able to initiate uh, as we get a little bit further in this lesson God was the uh, the one who initiated this captivity uh, that pronounced that they would go into captivity and he is the also the sovereign God who is bringing it to an end and he uh, uh, is telling them even in uh, the first verse of uh, Isaiah chapter 40 comfort yes comfort my people says the Lord so God is now comforting the same people that he has allowed to go into captivity so don't worry about what you're going through uh, God is able to comfort you we're going to share some scripture with you uh, as we get a little bit further into this lesson uh, because now we have as saved individuals we we have God's spirit um, by way of the Holy Ghost and so we he is, has been dispatched and assigned to us uh, even as a down payment as I believe Ephesians chapter 1 helps us to understand 
uh, but but what does he do and we're going to share some things with you a little bit later but uh, the question is asked here in the quarterly what evidence is there today that God is ultimately in control of the universe and 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 I just want to uh, uh, share this with you what do you see that has been fulfilled so the evidence is in uh, if we look at prophecy and the f the essence of prophecy uh, uh, if, if we're going to uh, believe it and appreciate it then it has to come to pass and so when we look at this prophecy uh, and what God has said and, and we can see that he is in control then we have to look at what has been fulfilled and those things that have not yet been fulfilled will be fulfilled because God has spoken those things he said it uh, and I believe it and so that is very important uh, for us to understand I believe Isaiah chapter 53 uh, asked that question initially um, in further writings he asked in verse 1 uh, Isaiah 53 verse 1 who has believed our report and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed so, so that's very important so what do we see that God has already done should help us to understand that if he uh, has did one thing he will do the other thing he is in full control but here the second uh, outline is entitled the ultimate authority this is taken from Isaiah chapter 40 uh, verses 25 through 27 and again from the NIV translation to whom will you compare me or who is my equal says the Holy One lift up your eyes and look to the heavens who created all these he who brings out the starry hosts one by one and calls forth each of them by name because of his great power and mighty strength not one of them is missing verse 27 why do you complain Jacob why do you say Israel my way is hidden from the Lord my cause is disregarded by my God so here Isaiah is is answering is asking and answering questions God is wanting to know who is like me and he tells them to lift up your eyes and look to the heavens who created all these things so that's what I said earlier we have a responsibility here uh, to lift up our eyes and we have to look and see for ourselves and see what the Lord has done uh, so there's none to compare and we should not believe or even think that some for some reason uh, that God has somehow forgotten about us and that uh, he is not aware uh, if he knows all of the, about the stars he created them and each one of them have a name and none of them is missing then what do you have to say about his greatest creation which is man himself but Isaiah proclaimed that God is the ultimate creator and that he uh, also possesses ultimate authority because he has no equal especially when compared to lifeless idols of Babylon when I was reading this I, I, I took a run over in uh, uh, Hebrews chapter uh, 6 uh, and I think I, I think I want to do that because it's important to understand uh, when we want to talk about God and and what he has said uh, we have to appreciate uh, his power uh, in his ability to be able to carry out these things but over in Hebrews uh, chapter 6 I want to go down to verse 13 and just a little bit of this you can read all of this but it would help you understand uh, that that when God makes a promise or he makes an oath that he, because he does not lie uh, he is able to bring this thing to pass but it goes on to say for when God made a promise to Abraham because he could swear by no one greater he swore by himself saying surely blessing 
I will bless you and multiplying I will multiply you in verse 15 and so after he had patiently uh, endured uh, that being Abraham the Bible says he obtained the promise but down at verse 18 it says that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us and so that is uh, beautiful to know and to see that if God has said something he is able to uh, bring it to pass and what I like about that passage in Hebrews when God could find no one other no one greater nobody greater than him the Bible says he swore by himself so be encouraged today that if God says uh, that he's going to do something uh, uh, he is able to do that thing but it goes on to say here it is he who made the stars as in, as innumerable as they are he also named and sustains each one of them uh, by his own power the stars of the heavens uh, made gods in pagan thought are mere servants who report to duty when God calls it goes on to say Isaiah affirmed the fact that God is greater than the stars and that they should not be worshipped or deified the creator is has ultimate authority over them and has placed them exactly where he wants them to be in light of knowing and acknowledging who God is Isaiah asked how the people could question whether God had forgotten them or lacked the power to deliver them as promised. The same God who made and named the stars also knew each of his people's names and was concerned about their circumstances. The good news is that he also knows each of our names. I want you to look at John chapter 10 verse 3 and verse 27 and every one of our current and future circumstances. Because he has no equal, there is nothing greater than he than he is and we can be assured that he has the ultimate authority to work all things out for our good and supply all of our needs. I want you to look at Romans chapter 8 verse 28 and Philippians chapter 4 verse 19 and these passages we know very well but there are times when we are going through trials and tribulations that we just can't see uh, our way out and we can't appreciate the fact that God knows or that he cares and and, and so we believe that we are somehow uh, rejected the enemy follows that up by telling us uh, lies and we believe those things but we have to uh, appreciate history here and I as I've said uh, for some time now history will either help us or it will hurt us uh, it hurts us because we don't learn uh, from these mistakes these historical accounts of God's people uh, we don't use these examples that uh, uh, Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 uh, about the mistakes that Israel made and how many of them were laid low in the wilderness. Uh, if we are going to make it and, and to persevere, we have to learn, even if we have to do that from the mistakes of others who have rejected God and had challenged him and have taken him on and introduced sin to their lives and other gods in their lives. If we go back over into Exodus chapter 20, God had plainly told them, Thou should have no other gods before me. So he is a jealous God. God he is a righteous jealousy uh, and he will not share you uh, with another. And so Israel and, and respectively and Judah should have understood that, but each went. Uh, Israel went into Assyrian captivity and Judah went into Babylonian captivity. So we need to understand that God has laid these things before us as examples that we should not follow in the same footsteps and then reap the same negative benefits. Uh, but But salvation is the key to this thing. 
uh, many of us don't appreciate the fact that uh, a way uh, accepting God's comfort comes through repentance, comes through accepting uh, God's message, comes through believing, and then we are able to tap into uh, the promises of God. But the question is asked here in the quarterly, what specific spiritual differences would occur individually and collectively if the church acknowledged God's absolute authority. Immediately I thought about the fruit of the Spirit. Immediately I thought about Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22. Uh, we would enjoy the fruit of the fellowship. We would enjoy the fruit of appreciating the message of God. And so many times we are not able to get the fruit because we have in uh, interpretation uh, issues with God's word uh, but it's clear in Galatians chapter 5 uh, beginning at verse 2 what the fruit of this fellowship would be what the fruit uh, the joy if you will of having this kind of fellowship would reach reap uh, so many uh, benefits in our lives on the individual level uh, and, and on a collective level uh, even as the church but in the first epistle of John, um, if we could just go over there for just a little bit and, and talk about uh, uh, what John said in the first chapter of his epistle, uh, the first epistle of John chapter 1. And I just want to read a little bit of this because it will help us understand some of the benefits that we could have uh, and we should have as people of God. John says here, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son Jesus Christ this is what I want you to take away verse 4 and these things we write to you that your joy may be full so these are the the differences would these that the things that would occur uh, if we acknowledged God's absolute authority we would have joy in knowing and expectation that God will fulfill what he said he would do and we would appreciate being under the covering uh, of his awesome power not worrying about anything that the devil is telling us that he's going to do and we would be able to have this manifestation that Galatians chapter 5 talks to us about our last outline is entitled the ultimate source of strength this is taken from Isaiah chapter 40 verses 28 through 31 and again from the NIV translations do you not know have you not heard the Lord is the everlasting God the creator of the ends of the earth he will not grow tired or weary and his understanding no one can fathom he gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. Verse 31, But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. And they will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. Hope can do a lot for us today. Confident expectation. Uh, it can really help us as a people today. Not uh, uh, living in discouragement and, 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 and the fact that uh, there's no way out. Uh, uh, and there's so much hopelessness in the world today because we are devoid of the promises of God. But once we have appreciated uh, these truths that God has given we will be able to through this hope uh, to mount up 
on wings like eagles. We will be able to mount up over the trials, the tribulations, uh, uh, as Jesus says, uh, to be of good cheer, you know, because he has overcome the world. And, and so if we're going to live, uh, we have to live in hope and expectation. God said it, we believe it. And if we do that, we will be able to tap into the strength of God. And we're going to give you some scripture in just a little bit because by nature of our fellowship with God, that is a, a distinct purpose of the Holy Spirit uh, to, uh, to strengthen us and to keep us and to remind us uh, what God has said. But here, the audience Isaiah was addressing was guilty of complaining that God was not cognizant of their situation and that he was not concerned about it. Hence, Isaiah's question in verse 27 referring to his statement about God's creative actions. In verse 26, he asked literally, uh, Since things are so, thou hast no reason to think that thine interest is disregarded by God. But God was acutely aware of their circumstances because he had orchestrated them in response to their sin of idolatry. He was not only aware of and concerned about, but also he was uh, uh, well able to address their needs. Unlike uh, lifeless idols or frail men, God was an, is eternal and never grows tired or weary. Since the eternal God never gets weary or grows tired, he is able to give strength to the weak and the weary. God was not too weak to act on their behalf, nor was uh, fatigued an, ob an obstacle for the Creator in caring for his people. Though even young and strong men become tired and fall, the Ancient of Days never does. The despondent Israelites must never forget who their God is. Number one, he's eternal. Number two, he's omnipotent. Number three, he's omnipresent. Number four, he's omniscient. Number five, God is constantly alert. And number six, he is compassionate. He can strengthen those who wait for him in faith. And I, I want to pause there for a minute because... We are not just waiting on God being stagnant uh, in life, not moving ahead in faith. And, and, and the commentary is very uh, complete in helping us understand how to wait on God. And how do we wait on God in faith? We have to keep uh, 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 eating the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So. We have to stay with the word of God in the good times and even through the difficult times. And, and God will strengthen you uh, in confident expectation. He will strengthen you in a, and bless you uh, to be able to endure. James tells us that in the first chapter of uh, his book, he says, count it all joy. You know, when we go in through these different things, we have to remember that sometimes God punishes us for our disobedience. The Bible is clear in telling us that those who God loves, he chastens. And so Israel was not counted out. Judah was not counted out. But they had to be punished uh, because of their sin. And God, because he is a holy God by nature, uh, he has to address the uh, sin uh, uh, as a whole. He has to address our disobedience. And so he causes and allows things to happen to us to help us understand the reality of his nature. And, and suffering sometimes cleanses us uh, uh, from the, uh, the sin that we are guilty of. Situations cause us to pray more often than we have been. And so it uh, causes us to uh, uh, attend services more regularly and and, and we, we learn through these 
uh, events in our lives how to persevere and don't ever think that 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 the saints of God don't experience this because we do and we learn and we do better God has high expectations for his people Peter tells us that in his epistle he says God says be holy for I am holy uh, says the Lord so we have to actually do these things and then uh, we could avoid a lot of things God had warned his people to change their behavior uh, so he uh, uh, prolonged their uh, judgments for a season but it came to a point where God uh, uh, saw his people not changing and not willing to receive his message uh, think about Jesus if you will if we look at the New Testament what would that mean and what does that look like what is what kind of message uh, does Jesus crucifixion send to God himself what kind of message are we sending to God that he will send a savior uh, and, and he be crucified for our sins what does that tell us uh, when we see men rejecting him uh, when they had an opportunity to speak up uh, uh, for Jesus uh, they said crucify him so that is a direct implication that uh, 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 that God and His messenger uh, is 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 rejected. Uh, Isaiah tells us that in the fifty third chapter that Jesus was despised and rejected. So it's very important that we learn these things from history uh, and avoid the mistakes. Still today, our God is interested in our. A human struggle and will provide strength to help us mount up with wings like eagles run and not be weary and continue to walk and not faint so here as we get to the close of this lesson I want to talk a little bit about the Holy Ghost because uh, we hear uh, many say that they have been filled with God's Spirit uh, but what does he do but I want to look at uh, uh, John chapter 14 and I want to go down to uh, verse 16 and we're gonna uh, talk a little bit about this because uh, this shows us here that God is concerned about us uh, this is Jesus talking here John chapter 14 verse 16 he says I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever verse 17 the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him but you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you verse 18 I will not leave you uh, orphans I will come to you so Jesus is talking to his disciples but when I did a little bit more digging into uh, some of the traits of the Holy Ghost and you can look for this in your life as a believer but the Holy Ghost uh, obviously represents your comfort he is a counselor he is a helper he is an intercessor he is an advocate he is a strengthener and he is a standby those are seven traits of the Holy Spirit's uh, role in your life in my life as a believer and God gave this spirit his spirit the Holy Spirit to you to act in all of these areas of your life so there's no place in life that we will be left alone because the Holy Spirit responds to all of these areas uh, as the need arises and I like the last one that he's on standby uh, uh, whenever uh, uh, we get into situations we can always call on the name of the Lord and he is ready and able to strengthen and to comfort and to counsel and to do we do we tap into these things or, or do we just quote the fact that we have God's spirit well what is his role in your life so God was trying to get across to his people Israel and, and Judah respectively he had not left them alone he always knew where they were he always knew what they were going through and he always 
had a plan not just to punish them but that plan was also to bring them out uh, with a mighty and an outstretched arm that was consistent with what he did with them in Egypt bringing them through the wilderness bringing them through many seen and unseen dangers not letting any diseases come up on them that had come up on the Egyptians protecting them from enemies you know the list goes on and on and on my point is they have a history with God and it continues to this day and even though some of them may have walked away from the Lord. If you read Romans chapter 9 through chapters 11, you will see that God has not left Israel by any means. And the Bible says God has already declared that they're going to be saved. There's absolutely nothing. He said it. But we we can argue about this all day long. And I'm just convinced that it's going to happen. I believe he will because he said it. And that's the point that we want to take away. Uh, Israel, Judah, respectively, are no different than you and I. We have, those of us that are saved, we have a history with God. We can look over, back over our lives and we can see that God was with us in every step of the way. Yes, we had some trials and some tribulations. We had some difficult challenges. We shed some tears. But if you're honest about this, when has God ever left you alone? So that's very important for us to know and to understand. I really appreciate being able to share this with you from the book of Isaiah and uh, dealing with this comfort. And we need it, as I said earlier, we are living in some times that we need God's comfort. Uh, nothing else is like God's comfort that nobody can do the things that he does and all Israel and Judah had to do was just accept it as we said earlier from the introduction accept the comfort uh, that is being offered uh, if you're listening to this message and you're not saved I want to make a plea that you give God an opportunity to comfort you. Jesus says these words in Matthew chapter 11. Come to me, all ye that labor and heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn. You know, and this is what we have to do. Uh, so the offering, while we have time, today is the day uh, uh, of, ex of, of acceptable uh, uh, salvation uh, today is the day to receive the promises of God and so if you are willing to believe if you are willing to believe the message that God concer uh, gave concerning his son if you are willing to accept it you can tap in to this prophecy you can tap into the, its fulfillment in Christ and you can certainly tap into the second coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ I want to offer this closing prayer that is in our quarterly dear God in this world of turmoil and oppression we thank you for the revelation of your comforting attributes of omniscience omnipresence and omnipotence in Jesus name we pray Amen. So we certainly thank and praise God that we have been able to share this with you. We hope that you have been encouraged by it. Look up, look ahead. God is still on the throne and he has all power in heaven and earth in his hands. So until such time that the Lord will permit us to come together again, we say God bless you.